So welcome everybody to the uh, Water and Health Conference. Uh, thank you all for coming uh, to this session. Uh, we first got a few announcements before we can start the uh, session, before we go on to our presenters. First, we wanna encourage you to come to our networking event uh, this afternoon uh, on Remo. Instructions for joining that is, are on the uh, conference website. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we've, if you've missed a bunch of events today and want to know what we, was, what we talked about today, we have the late early show tomorrow that you can uh, hop on to and get a summary of what we've talked about today at the conference. Next slide, please. Uh, we have a few technical announcements as well. Uh, the first is that this, these sessions are being recorded, so just be aware of that. The second is that the Zoom chat has been disabled, so all when we get to the Q&A sessions, all chat needs to be through the Pathable Chat tab, which you can see here on the screen. So put all of your questions that you have for our presenters there. Uh, we also wanna thank our sponsors for this event, uh, Mel Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Comonix. And uh, next slide with that, we can go ahead and introduce our uh, pen, our presenters today, uh, Valerie Bauza and Subash Chinnery. So uh, Valerie will be our first speaker uh, and presenting on, and she can go ahead and load up, uh, screen share her uh, slides if she wants. So we'll, right now it's in the um, editing view. There we go, that's good, great. And you're muted. All right, great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited to present today about acceptability and use characteristics of latrine maps that we tested um, and implemented as part of an intervention cluster RCT in rural Odisha, India. Um, our motivation for this was um, when we measured the child feces disposal practices of households with improved latrines in the study area um, in the past. And even though over 90% of adults in the household reported to use the latrine, only 40% of children's feces was being disposed of into the latrine. And a lot of it was ending up in disposed with garbage. Um, which ended up basically meaning that it was being dumped to an open area that was often just 30 seconds or a minute from the house. So a lot of the children's species was staying near the home and continuing to contaminate that environment. And when we looked at whose species was ending up in the latrine, 85% of those children had actually defecated in the latrine themselves. So this um, made us think that, hey, if we can get more children to use the latrine at an earlier age, this could improve overall disposal. And one of the enabling technologies or tools that we found that could potentially help with this was actually a portable latrine mat that was developed over 10 years ago for the WASH benefit study during formative research and only tested in a handful of households um, that had earth latrines where the hole was very large that children could even potentially fall in the pit. But despite promising results, um, this actually wasn't really developed or used any farther, but it was the inspiration um, for work that we started doing on latrine mats in India. And so the study objective for the presentation today um, is to assess the feasibility, acceptability, and use characteristics of three different types of latrine mats that, um, for use specifically with poor flush latrines that they have in rural Odisha, India. The villages that we worked in specifically had completed a matra intervention in order to gain high levels of access to latrines and pipes water. So they had all the enabling um, environment that's necessary to actually be able to get children to use the latrine. And um, these were all typically poor flush latrines. You can see from the pictures that often um, the pan in the latrine looks like it could be a little large for young children to be able to successfully squat under. Um, the villages we worked in had over 75% latrine coverage in the villages. And the piped water um, was typically connected to households and latrines as well. 
and was um, available for the majority of the year. Um, we started out by doing focus group discussions to look at barriers to potential latrine training and youth. Um, and the two things that mostly came out were caregivers reporting fear that a child could flip and fall into the squat pan, as well as caregivers feeling that it was very time consuming to teach a child how to use the latrine because the child needed to be held or watched while they were using it. So we took that information and tried to integrate it um, into designing tools at user-centered design sessions where we engage both mothers and stakeholders to brainstorm and co-design um, hardware, as well as get feedback on currently available hardware and ways to improve it. And this spanned a wide range, including things like potties and scoops. Although for the presentation today, almost I'll be focusing solely on the latrine maps um, just for sake of time. We then took the best um, hardware ideas from those design sessions and we tested them um, in households in eight villages. And we iterated on the latrine map design between um, two different rounds of piloting. Um, the best design was then implemented as part of a behavior change intervention as part of a cluster RCT in 74 villages. And um, in the presentation today, I'll mostly be focusing on the results of that hardware pilot, but I will also give a few results on feedback related to hardware um, from that RCT as well. To go over the three different versions of the latrine maps that we piloted, um, this is the first version that I'll refer to as the basic version. It was a simple painted um, plywood mat that had plastic feet that would keep it from slipping in the latrine and also raise it up so it wouldn't get as dirty and had a nice large front handle that children could grab onto to support themselves. The second version was very similar to the first, only with the addition of a plastic seat um, that caregivers thought could allow a child to be provided with more support. Um, as well as make the mat easier to clean um, because of the plastic. And then the third version um, is the version that was iterated between the rounds of the hardware pilot because people were reporting that even though they liked using the latrine mat in the latrine during the day, often the child would still be defecating in the home at night. Um, so we wanted to give a way that caregivers could continue to practice safe practices with their children and squatting while still being able to safely dispose of in the latrine. So this can both be used in the latrine as well as uh, over the ground um, with the tray in place. So the first two versions, we distributed it to slightly older children between two um, to less than five years old. And the last version was able to be used with much younger children because it could be used outside of the latrine. Um, and even with the bedpan alone. And so we were able to give it to children um, eight months and above. Um, the latrine mat overall, all versions had pretty high use except for the latrine mat with seat had the lowest levels of use. And these were usually actually for hardware related reasons with that version where the child did not agree to use the mat because they typically thought that um, it was their toy and they didn't want to defecate on their toy, I think due to the plastic nature of it. Um, they also, it was also reported that they found it really congested, so it didn't have enough space for the children. Whereas um, households that reported that they didn't use the other versions, they were things that weren't really related to the design of the hardware, such as just the child was already using the latrine, so they didn't have a use for it. The majority of the children were also very comfortable with the mat within one week or less of the introduction, though again, um, children were still not comfortable with the seat mat. More children were still not comfortable with the seat um, mat two weeks later. And the number of children that received these mats were actually already using the latrine before they got the mat. Um, however, caregivers for a lot of them said they still found the mat useful and necessary for those children because they found it to save time as the child no longer needed to be held or watched. The child had less fear using the latrine and they also felt more comfortable using the latrine. Um, and I just wanted to share an example quote from a participant where she described how her child used to need to be held while, while squatting, um, but now because the child was scared, but now he can sit on his own. Um, and he was scared before because the le his legs couldn't fit 
around the hole in the latrine so he was scared of falling. Um, when we looked at all different characteristics across the versions, um, both the basic and the latrine mat with tray had high ease of use and most other factors, um, but the latrine mat with seat was the hardest to use. However, we ended up selecting um, the latrine mat with tray because it could be used for those different time periods like nighttime, as well as it was easier to use with younger children. And so that was the version that was implemented in the 74 village trial. I'm just going to present quickly um, a few results from that trial, but the N-line data collection actually just ended on Friday. So they're very preliminary and it hasn't been rigorously cleaned yet, but I just want it to show um, general trends in the data. So over the course of the study, actually, the majority of children actually were able to use the latrine mat on their own and didn't need to be held, which caregivers found as a great benefit of the mat. When we asked um, at Endline, which was approximately seven to nine months after they had first received the mat, a quarter were still use, had still used it within the past week, um, but over a third had used it you know, when they first got it, had trained the child how to use the latrine with it, but stopped using it because they no longer needed it to use the latrine. And so that was what, that was basically the transition that we were hoping children would make with this mat. And then together with the children who had already used the latrine and didn't need that, over 75% of children who had received the mats were either using the mats or using the latrine. And only 16% reported difficulty using it either because of child refusal or, or actual difficulty with the mat. The mats also um, were very durable. Over 90% showed no substantial damage seven to nine months later. And these are just two examples, um, one that was stored inside and one that was stored outside. And you can see the one stored outside that hasn't been used in a while is dirty, but it's still generally in good shape. So just to summarize, um, the major points, we found that latrine mats had high levels of acceptability and use in these poor flush latrines, and caregivers felt that the latrine mats made it both safer and easier for a child to use the latrine. The specific design of the latrine mat influenced acceptability and ease of use of the mat. Um, we found that handles and the removable tray were very desirable features that made it easier to use and easier to use for a wider range of child ages, but adding something like a plastic seat made it more difficult to use. And that was interesting because actually during the design sessions, the version with the seat was the version that everyone thought that they liked the best. And it wasn't until they got a chance to use it that they realized that it wouldn't um, work as well with their children. And they also, we also found that they were durable um, despite you know, being made out of plywood, um, and they assisted children in transitions to latrine use, so children could use them for a period of time to get more comfortable with using the latrine, so they could potentially help improve child feces management practices and child latrine use. Um, I just want to acknowledge and thank all of our great study teams uh, that helped with these projects and our funding sources, and um, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. I can just put that up. Yes, thank you, Valerie, for presenting. Everyone, please uh, put your questions in the uh, chat tab in the Pathable uh, link, the pathogen, Pathable session for this uh, event. Um, and let me know if you have any problems finding that. I sort of had, you may have said this at the beginning and I missed it, but I was sort of, Curious, like how how well did these like fit over pre existing hardware? Yeah, so they look. I have a picture. Um. Yeah, so I guess I can't zoom in, but so in the uh, lower right hand corner, there's a picture of. Um, how it fits over the squat plate in the latrine. So you can see that um, it fits like pretty um, perfectly over the plate um, to cover the hole would be about this big without it. So it just creates this little hole and kind of fits perfectly over um, that existing squat plate hardware. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, so we have a few other questions that are now in the chat. So the first is uh, from uh, Nuhu. Uh, can you describe the uh, maintenance and additional tasks uh, that this involves for the mother and caregiver? Sure. Um, so the maintenance is basically um, that we ask caregivers to clean the mat um, either with water or water and soap if the mat has any feces on it after they use it and then to dry it in the sun. Um, so it could increase extra tasks in interviews. A lot of caregivers described it as actually being time saving for them or easier to use because they found that that was less cleaning than what they would have to do when the child was defecating on the ground, um, where they have to pick it up and clean the material that they use to handle it as well as the ground. But those are um, some additional steps. So if a child was already using the latrine, this would probably potentially add uh, more cleaning steps, but it may give them more free time if the child no, now no longer needs to be held while they're defecating and maybe in the latrine for a while. Some people report it that it would take almost 30 minutes for a child to defecate when they were training. Okay, thank you. Uh, so another question is, uh, are you planning to do more uh, follow-up with these households to uh, learn about uh, the transition from the mat to actual use? Yeah, so we did um, in-depth interviews with the households. I think it was about, it was four, four or five months after um, they first received. And we asked a lot of questions about the transitions um, in those, but I like we haven't completed the full analysis of those yet. Um, how do you think uh, this would be scaled up? Uh, what barriers do you think there would be to scaling this up? Yeah, so um, the but, well, so we did all of this work with a local NGO that's worked in the community for decades, and they actually would like to scale up um, kind of the larger behavior change intervention with this to all a lot like all of their villages. Um, and I think one of the barriers to the perfect um, mat that we supplied is just the cost and some of during COVID some of the materials were harder to get like the handles it was harder to procure them during COVID because of the supply chain issues um, and so we've had discussions with the NGO about like those barriers and they've talked a lot about how um, there's other cheaper readily available materials that can be used to replace some of those that might be harder to get in the villages there's local carpenters that can make um, you know, a lot of the wood, wooden components of the mat. And so I think for scale up, one of the barriers could be the cost. And it may just be that they don't need to be as um, prettily painted uh, with as nice of handles. And they might be made of like more cheaper locally available materials. Um, but I think that that could still help them scale up. There's also potential um, that some households discuss just um, having their child defecate over the tray. So if the child's not yet ready to use the latrine, it's like a safer way that's sort of like a squatting potty. And so that can help for some young children as well um, to eliminate possibly a cost barrier. Um, thank you. Uh, do you, so uh, we just have time for one more question. Uh, is the tray component of the piloted version readily available locally? Uh, do, you, do you know what all is involved in, in the manufacture? Uh, yeah. which of a so the tray specifically is locally available um, in these areas. It's used as a bedpan at like all of the local hospitals and things in the area. So that is very locally available. And it's very, it's cheap as well. I think it the bedpan specifically costs about $2 or less than $2? That was a quick answer. So we actually have one more. <laughs> so, um, oh no, no, I, I miscounted. No, that's that's the time we have for the Q&A. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, the rest of the questions are saved and pathable, so you can go back and later and look at them if you want, or other people can go and see what, uh, what they were, but we need to move on to your next presentation. Um, and so, Valerie, if you could share your next uh, your next set of slides. Okay. 
Um, okay, great. So for my next presentation, I'm going to talk about a different aspect of sanitation that I think also um, doesn't get quite as much focus as latrine access, and that's fecal sludge management and pit emptying behaviors. And particularly in India, um, where there had um, historically been the most open defecation in the world, there's been several recent programs run both by the government and NGOs that have improved um, latrine access. The most recent government program was SBM, and it was initiated in 2014 by the government with the goal of eliminating open defecation. Um, and they did declare that it was successful at eliminating open defecation by 2019. Um, I think that any of us who have been to India since then know that there is still open defecation that has continued, but it made drastic improvements overall with latrine access. And they do quote that they um, over 100 million latrines have been installed as part of the program, and they're currently working on phase two, which has more sustainability aspects. Um, as an example of an NGO initiative to improve latrine access, um, mantra was implemented by NGO Ground Vikas in lots of villages in Rilidisha, and they focus on village-wide water and sanitation as part of a more comprehensive program. Although a lot of these programs do have sustainability aspects in mind, um, a lot of times focus does more heavily focus on things like latrine access, and it's just important to consider that safe management has to include a holistic approach. So there has to be access to adequate sanitation facilities. They have to be consistently used and the fecal sludge has to be safely managed for it to be safe overall. One design that is promoted a lot to help um, assist with safe fecal sludge management is a twin pit toilet design. And basically there's a wide junction coming off the squat plate um, where instead of all of the fecal sludge going into one pit, you can um, close off one pit and only use, only empty or only have the sludge being filling one pit at a time. And then when that gets full, you can um, close it off, seal it, let it sit for a year or two. So the pathogens can get inactivated while you're using the other pit. And then the sludge from the first pit um, should be safe to then be emptied without posing a risk to the pit emptier, and it can usually be used as fertilizer. So with that in mind, um, we set out to characterize the pit emptying and fecal sludge management practices in a number of households in Rilidisha, India. Um, most who had received uh, latrines either as part of a government or NGO um, campaign. Our study areas covered three different districts within the Odisha state. So Puri was, uh, is a coastal district that has, usually the villages are closer in access to cities um, versus Ganjam and Gajapati that are a bit more remote. They have more areas that are hilly and mountainous. And so the villages can be more remote, although there are some that are also close to cities as well. The data that we used um, for the study was collected as part of the baseline data collection for two separate um, cluster RCTs. So one that was in 64 villages in Puri and one that was in 74 um, villages in Ganjam and Gajapati. Um, and then that one, we'll, we're also using a bit of data from the endline data collection since the intervention um, only focused on safe child feces disposal. So it shouldn't have had any impact on fecal sludge management practices. And we had questions um, that we added to endline to follow up on some interesting things that we found in baseline. Um, just to show what these latrines look like, here's some examples of latrines in the Puri district um, that were installed mostly under the SBM program. And again, these are all poor flush latrines um, that have squat plates. And this is, these were typically one pit. And this is just, these are just pictures of kind of what the pit looks like. They're usually um, in the ground behind the latrine or slightly raised. The mantra infrastructure was similar with the exception that all these villages all have um, piped water tanks um, and piped water that's usually installed to both the household and latrine. And at the time that the, um, the mantra intervention was delivered, all households in the village had to have 
a latrine as part of the intervention. So the village coverage is quite high. Um, this is also just an example of what the infrastructure looks like for the twin pits that were typically installed as part of Mantra. And you can see in the Y junction um, that it would be possible to install something to close one of those lines off so only one pit is being filled at a time. Um, to report on the characteristics that we found, um, as we expected, the majority of households across both of these study areas only had one latrine. In the Puri study area, um, almost all of them only had one pit or septic tank, whereas in the Mantra area, it was more common um, to have two pits. And the I, I'll refer, the funding source for Puri was mostly SBM, although some were also self-funded. And so I'm just gonna refer to them as the Puri SBM throughout because all of the households likely had some messaging from um, the SBM campaign, even if they didn't get funding from that. Whereas in the Mantra campaign, most of them were all or partially funded by Mantra. And usually households had to provide labor and some, um, labor and some money as well for the latrine. The, the latrines in Puri were much newer than the Mantra latrines. So as I said, this campaign was recent and it installed um, tons of latrines across India. So the majority of these are less than five years old, um, whereas the Mantra ones are a bit older and most were over five years. And similarly, most of the Puri SBM latrines had not been emptied yet. Only a small portion had um, whereas a higher amount of the mantra ones had been emptied. Or had been filled, sorry, not emptied, but had been filled. Um, then when we looked at what action was taken when the pit was filled, um, this is how that data broke down. And just to explain what you're looking at here, um, the blue bars are um, showing the data from the Puri study and the orange are from the Mantra study. The first bar in each is among all the latrines that were surveyed in that study area, whereas the second bar is only looking at latrines that had at least two pits, so potentially could switch. So one good thing that we found was across all the study areas, it was pretty rare for everyone to stop using or restrict use once the pit was full. So people wanted to continue to use the latrines and they found another thing to do. But one thing that was surprising and slightly disappointing um, was that even among the latrines that had two pits, it was pretty rare, um, particularly in the mantra villages, for people to switch to using a second pit instead of emptying um, the pit right away. So we asked more questions about how long at, um, before the pit was emptied, how long had it not been in use? Because it typically needs one or two years of non-use in these types of latrines for the pathogens to be inactivated. So it's safe for people to empty it and have that close contact and for it to be applied for, to um, fields as fertilizer. And almost 75%, even in the latrines that had at least two pits, uh, had been emptied one month or less after it was filled. When we asked why, um, we learned that actually, despite having those Y junctions that have the potential to block one section, so only one pit is being filled at the time, majority actually didn't function in that way. And so both pits were being filled at the same time. So the household couldn't switch between them. So they would have to empty the pit quickly. And there was also a large proportion of households that were worried that the pit would smell if it wasn't emptied quickly. Um, so these are barriers to ideal practices that would need to be addressed in order to allow twin pit latrines to function as desired. Um, when asked how the pit was emptied, someone um, in the family had manually emptied the pit the most like the majority of the time in the Mantra region where a lot of the villages were more remote and farther away from cities. Whereas in the Puri region that was closer to cities, it was more like it was pretty split between someone doing it themselves or hiring someone to empty manually um, or using a tanker. And it was 
common for people to use some form of personal protection and that was often inadequate, maybe boots or a pair of gloves. And there were still um, plenty of people who weren't using any protection at all, which is concerning. Um, I just quickly wanted to share some quotes to give a, more of a picture of what it looked like when the pits were being emptied. Um, so one participant said that they basically brought uh, they hired someone to empty their pit and brought a bamboo version of the tool that I have on this slide to get the sludge out and they threw it in a separate pond um, where it just stays in the water near their house and isn't used. Another participant said that they hire a particular um, cast group whose members are expected to empty the pits and they come after they drink alcohol. So that they it's, so it's easier for them. They don't have they're not as aware of what they're doing or the smell. Um, and then they load it up and they throw it in the field. A last participant who had emptied the pit themselves said he wasn't allowed to eat uh, with his family for three days, like while he was emptying it because of um, the potential smell that could linger on him and things of that nature. And then he did not use any kind of protective gear, not even boots or uh, gloves when he was emptying it. And so across emptying practices, um, I just quickly wanted to show that a number of participants had actually done things to help with the smell of emptying, such as pouring kerosene in the pit or covering their face and nose. And once the pit um, sludge was emptied, um, in the Puri region, it was more common for it to be disposed of by being buried in a hall or having a municipality or private service take it, which would be considered safer. But um, overall, in both districts, there were still a lot of households that were either disposing of it in their fields or leaving it in the open, even though it was being quickly emptied and not being allowed for it to be um, safe and have pathogens fully inactivated. So just to summarize, um, we found that pit emptying and sludge disposal practices were often unsafe across latrines that were implemented in both different districts and by different programs in rural Odisha, both from government programs and an NGO program. Um, we identified barriers that prevented many households from following what was an intended ideal practice um, for twin pits. Um, which are installed specifically to allow pathogens in one pit to be inactivated before emptying while another pit is being used. And many of these latrines were relatively new and had not been emptied yet. And as I said, SBM says that they've installed, you know, over 100 million latrines across the country. And so there's going to be a lot more pit emptying that needs to happen in the future. And so I think it's important um, to look at lessons learned and look at other factors to help encourage safer pit emptying in the future and reduce hazards that we know are currently happening to both pit emptiers and the surrounding environment. Again, I just wanna thank all the wonderful research teams and funding for this um, and happy to take uh, questions about this work. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, everyone, just like last time, go ahead and put your uh, questions into the uh, pathable chat and I'll ask them to Valerie. Um, so we've got several questions about uh, the functioning of the twin pits. Uh, one of the one of the person asks about uh, how they've often heard that uh, it's fine after a year from not not touching it, but they haven't really you know seen evidence. Have good evidence, good references for that, and if there's um, any kind of good resource you know for that. And to the same person also asks, um, did people uh, know that they can block one side of the Y junction, or if they tried blocking some sort of ma manual way of blocking the junction and it didn't work? Sure. Um, so I guess for the first question, the exact time that it takes for like this like specific pathogens to be inactivated does depend on conditions such as um, temperature and pH and factors like that. So usually one year or two years is like given, but it's not universally applicable. So it could change, you know, between different factors. 
Um, off the top of my head, like I've seen many sources with different times. I can't think of one off the top of my head, but I'd be happy to follow up and share that um, with someone later. As far as the second question about um, households know, like trying to block pit or, or block one channel on their own, or even knowing if they can do that, I think that we would need to do more follow up interviews specifically about that. Um, we have assumptions that like, because some people like they're like in other parts of India in particular, there's concerns around pits filling too quickly. So we think that some people might like to fill both pits purposely at the same time, just so it lasts longer before they have to empty. Um, and some people don't like have told us that they just like having a backup pit. So they always want to empty one of their pits right away because they like having a backup. So they always have um, the latrine available. But to dig deeper into that, I think we would need to do um, even more interviews. Uh, I had a question of, of the emptying methods. Um, you, you had the... Um, the hand pump and the tanker in this sort of the same category. I was curious what the breakdown between those were. Yeah, um, I mean, I think typically they are they're separated into different categories. I group them together here just to try to make the slide a little bit cleaner. Mm -hmm. um, but like the mechanical hand pump versus the tanker, a tanker is like can be a lot larger, and so mm -hmm. you know you you would need to have good roads and things to be able to get a tanker. Um, to empty it. And I think it's more common with septic tanks that have um, higher liquid in the, the fecal sludge, whereas a hand pump can be smaller. It can be on a truck or it can be like a smaller um, thing that can be navigated easier when there's not as like good of roads. Like it, it can be a smaller equipment. And so like, what do you have any idea what like the breakdown between those two were in the population you surveyed? Um, so for the mantra, the tanker was really uncommon. And I, um, because like I said, a lot of those were more remote and rural areas. In the Puri data, I think it was about half and half, if I remember correctly. Okay, and so we've got uh, one more question. Um, did you uh, find any cast dimension in terms of who emptied the pits? Like which, in addition to who was hired to empty the pits, also like what families emptied the pits themselves? Yeah, I mean, so some people report it specifically that they would, if they were hiring someone, they usually hired someone who was a lower caste than themselves. Um, and sometimes people talked about hiring someone who, you know, is of a specific caste that they expect to clean their, the, to um, empty the pits. I did not look specifically yet at um, what the casts were for the households that said they emptied the pits themselves versus households who hired some, someone. I would have to look at that more specifically in the data, but that would be an interesting thing to look deeper at. Okay. Um, well, we're, we're almost we're out of time for this question round again, but uh, thank you all everybody for giving your questions. Uh, we're now going to move on to our next presenter. Um, uh, Subash, could you please uh, share your screen and we can start your presentation whenever you're ready. Well, thank you, Catherine, and thank you, Valerie, for the very interesting findings. Uh, so today we'll be speaking about the concept of demand activation in the context of market-based sanitation approaches and particularly what it means for sanitation enterprises that uh, sell or supply toilets to households. So desk review on market-based sanitation or MBS found that uh, demand generation using methods such as behavior change communications and CLTS is a well-established practice that can trigger households' interest in altering the sanitation behavior. But uh, that does not necessarily mean it can translate into the sale of toilets. So for instance, I might have an interest in shifting from open defecation or using an unimproved toilet to adopting a basic toilet. 
But unless I get more information about the products, where to buy, and more in, importantly is the persuasion, I might not actually spend the money and go through with that purchase. And this situation is not uh, peculiar or unique to toilets and is the case with more, in most commercial contexts. Although the degree of persuasion that requires will really vary upon the product or service in question. So mechanisms uh, are required to activate what we call as this latent demand, which is there is a desire, uh, but one that's not been uh, followed through which requires enterprises to pursue sales and marketing strategies that um, often need to be developed by MBS programs. So when we look at programs, um, such strategies were and remain crucial to the sale of toilets during and even after an intervention ends. Um, among the several MBS programs that we had studied, the largest in terms of toilets sold, such as the IDE and the watershed programs in Cambodia, the uh, funded 3 si program in India, develop sales agents mechanisms to drive customer acquisition for their partner enterprises. So while these numbers are at a program level um, and the adoption of such mechanisms uh, by enterprises, however, may not be homogenous. And um, we posit that the adoption or not of um, any sales and marketing mechanisms impacts the enterprise's scale, their profits, and in turn, their viability um, or the ability to function independent without any form of form, uh, external support. So as part of a study to understand the factors that explain why one enterprise performs better than another. We had analyzed the financial performance and the business practices pursued by you know, 66 enterprises in three countries. Um, and among the five profit drivers that explain why one enterprise uh, generates more profit than another was increasing the number of customers. So by and large, we found that enterprises acquired customers by employing sales agents to sell toilets on their behalf in exchange for a sales commission. And they also partnered with a range of influential individuals such as village leaders, health volunteers, uh, to, uh, who might have non-financial incentives for selling toilets. And while some entrepreneurs did claim to supplement these efforts with their own marketing, um, efforts such as organizing village meetings, it is likely that the, their time for these activities was limited. But the important thing is that um, it's not simply enough to just partner with agents. Uh, increasing sales through them it depends on the enterprise's level of engagement with these agents. Uh, those that uh, sold uh, a large number of toilets um, actively recruited and managed agents beyond the ones that were introduced to them by MBS programs. Uh, they period periodically met with them, resolved issues, adjusted the financial incentives to keep them motivated. When we look at smaller enterprises, uh, those that full, sold fewer toilets, by contrast, they were relatively passive. Sure, they partnered with agents that the program introduced, but their relationships were at best uh, transactional, um, which may not have motivated the agents or at best they might have shared orders that uh, came across now and then. Now, leveraging the, this uh, independent sales agent mechanism is a low risk high return uh, for uh, so tactic for sanitation enterprises. And that's because under this commission model, enterprises don't have to pay anything upfront. They only pay commissions when they get confirmed orders. And um, even if such sales are far and few in between, the enterprise still benefits um, from the sales rather than not having them at all. Moreover, uh, partnering with the sales agents enables enterprises to go beyond their home market and target more customers. It might not be feasible for entrepreneurs to frequently visit other villages to market their toilets, but it is feasible for, say, existing agents to travel to other villages or for enterprises to hire agents in those villages and get orders as and when they come through. 
So we recommend that uh, programs should therefore persuade enterprises to invest in hiring sales agents, uh, but by positioning it as a way to drive the sales, increase the profit and their income, which is of ultimate interest to these entrepreneurs. Interestingly, when we also did find that gender does play a role in the efficacy of the sales agents. So in many cultures, uh, women are better placed than men to approach uh, female household members uh, who themselves have varying degrees of decision-making rights or influence uh, to discuss the sanitation and hygiene related issues. And it assumes importance in cultures such as the one in Bihar, India, where we visited, uh, where men approaching or conversing with women who aren't related to to them through family is uh, taboo or, or, or frowned upon. So for this reason, some enterprises in Bihar had uh, preferred partnering with female sales agents, particularly those who were members of local savings or self-help groups, because uh, such groups provided a captive audience uh, to pitch toilets and influence purchase decisions in households. But female sales agents do face challenges with mobility to cover these distance villages, um, especially if they do not receive the support from their families. Expectations to spend time at home or attend to household responsibilities also impacts at the time that they spend on the ground selling. So while data from the program shows that uh, women sold nearly the same volumes as men on an aggregate basis, Adjusting for limitations in geographic mobility and the lesser time spent selling uh, meant that female sales agents actually appear to be far more effective than their male counterparts. Therefore, we recommend that in contexts where it is socially or culturally appropriate for women to work outside their home, programs actively explore roles for women in, in selling, if not manufacturing toilets. I'd also like to draw your attention to a washpals grant to ID neighboring Nepal, where there were several important differences in the efficacy of women compared to men in selling toilets and also sustaining post-purchase uh, post uh, usage. And it has some important lessons in terms of matching household, uh, intra-household behaviors um, or socioeconomic profiles to leverage the appropriate sales agent. The last, um, while the owners to develop and iterate on such mechanism often falls in programs, the sustainability of such mechanisms um, after the program ends is critical because reliance on non-market support or donor funding risks a breakdown. For instance, when we evaluated the operational independence or the ability of entrepreneurs and sales agents to continue this, this arrangement that they had, without intervention by a program. Um, in one case, we studied that the program trained a cadre of agents um, with a view to initially manage them until entrepreneurs would appreciate the value and take over the responsibility of managing them. But this arrangement set expectations among many agents and entrepreneurs that the program would continue doing so as uh, act as an intermediary in perpetuity. And uh, when the program halted support, some entrepreneurs simply refuse to take on this responsibility, leading to the agents seeking other income opportunities and thus um, ending a critical source of sales for these enterprises. And similar was the case for um, when you look at the financial independence, which is um, where many enterprises, they dependent, dependent on the program to pay for the sales agents, the commissions, and uh, they had not factored these costs uh, in their pricing. And we estimated that if such um, enterprises assume these uh, agents' costs, then their profits would decline. And alarmingly so for those uh, enterprises that had low profits, they would simply end up making losses, implying that even if they wanted to employ these agents, they would be unable to do so. So while in this case uh, illustrates the consequences or the risk of programs playing an active or a direct role in the market, we've seen other cases that make clear that the sooner programs encourage direct interactions among the market actors and make enterprises pay for such costs from the beginning, the more the likelihood that this mechanism will sustain 
irrespective of any external funding or support. So uh, that's our time, and now we welcome any questions from the audience. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, you guys, uh, just like the previous two times, just put your questions in the chat box on Pathable, and I'll uh, ask them, uh, I'll relate them to our speaker. Um, So I have a question, I'm trying to figure out how, how exactly to word it, but um, uh, like what type of like sort of, uh, uh, oh, we have a question for the audience. Uh, was there uh, any type of information found on the timelines for these enterprises? Uh, for example, for the ones that failed or were failing, uh, was there a typical amount of time from starting operations to closing? That's a great question, and it would be variable. Um, what we found is uh, pretty much within the year of operations, the entrepreneurs would figure out if they were making money, and this is ind independent of whether they pursued, say, recommended practices or what the program would suggest. Um, but uh, Either it was that at the beginning, if they didn't make money, they just uh, exited from the market. Um, interestingly, if uh, organize, uh, enterprises made uh, losses for even two years in a row, but had experienced profit at some, at some other point in time earlier before that, they continued to just consider it as part and parcel of the business. So um, I would give it anywhere. The, the first year or so is, uh, was pretty crucial um, from the ones that we did give you. Uh, and another question was, um, was there any information on like the best type of sales agents besides gender? Um, well, that's uh, like making a question about what's the best salesperson. Um, I don't think we have enough, but from what we learned from the programs, so uh, qualitatively, um, there were differences. So A, one was if it was uh, pe uh, people who were young in age, uh, those who may not have had that many other um, income generation opportunities and um, did follow the training that they received uh, from the programs in order to pursue households. So one was there, there was some persistence also over there, not uh, also just recognizing that they were their ability to travel. Um, across uh, several villages uh, and spend more time on the ground. Um, but I just want to do point out about within gender as well, uh, from the gender dimension. Um, so while among young women, there was a variation in terms of uh, how much time they could possibly spend at home, outside, uh, the kind of support that they had. It was women who were, who were aged about like 40 or more um, who were more also effective because either they had someone else at the home taking care of uh, some of the responsibilities also with them and uh, due to their age also they might not have had faced uh, that many restrictions in terms of the time that they spent outside. I think those were um, two, two interesting angles that we did learn. Uh, and I think uh, if there I had a question of like you guys looked at sort of business enabling like the enabling environments for 
in the, within the business to have these Excel. And I was curious, like what sort of like policy policies were present, uh, governmental policies were present that help if you guys looked at, at all at looking, you guys looked at all at the government policies that sort of helped uh, provide an enabling environments for the success or failure of these programs. Uh, great question again. Um, in two contexts, at least, uh, one the India, uh, the Swaj Bharat mission in Cambodia, there was uh, a, a long standing campaign, I think it was Stop the Diary or so, which had already raised a lot of uh, awareness about include toilets and the need for toilets. And uh, the agents were able to capitalize on these campaigns to persuade and also to actually go ahead with it. So they didn't have to necessarily go through the entire cycle of first pursuing and also to alter the sanitation behavior and then get them to uh, purchase a toilet. So in some sense, part of the demand generation aspect was already done. They just had to activate the demand. Okay, well, thank you everyone in the audience for your questions. Uh, thank you, Valerie and Subash for your uh, great presentations and Q&A. Uh, we've, uh, we're running towards the end of this uh, panel and there doesn't seem to be any other uh, audience. Oh, well, if you want to answer an audience question in a minute, we have one more audience question. Um, I don't know that that's up to you, Savash, but uh, um, otherwise we've, uh, I don't know, do you, do you, do you we, <laughs> Yeah, I can just take that very quickly. Yes, um, I think Cambodia was an interesting case in terms of market saturation. Uh, yes, it did happen that once you reach about say 70 or, or percent uh, sales did indeed slow down. But um, the important thing is the entrepreneurs uh, had several businesses. So to toilets wasn't the only one that it depended on. Yet um, they did retain the capability that if and when orders came in from new household formation, uh, or, or any such population growth in general, they have the ability to do so um, whilst not being fully dependent on it for their income. So yes, it's very much a, a, a market that continues to function, uh, even if it's a slower sales then. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, we just wanna you know, thank our sponsors again. Um, tempted to share the screen, I don't know if that worked yet. And, and to remind you guys that we have um, we have this networking event at uh, 3.30 that you guys are welcome uh, to come and join and that we have the uh, late early show uh, tomorrow morning to uh, uh, go over today's uh, events. Uh, that, um, that's the uh, end of this panel. Thank you again to our presenters and the audience.